can't go through everything. This is 14 pages of it. Okay? Um, for those who just came in, um, you might want to come down to get some lecture notes. We'll wait a couple more minutes because I think I heard people had a great time last night, so most people haven't slept too late. <laughs> So for those who came in late, you might not want to sit too far from people because you wouldn't know that the others actually had lecture notes, and of course we'll play games after. Carlo? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So today we're going to go through a little bit more derivations because I think a lot of people were asking me questions yesterday, and I figure it's not going to hurt if I go through a little bit of derivations. Um, what I'm going to show you next, which is in this slides, will be following the beginning of the lecture notes that you just got. Okay? Um, let's go back to what we left off yesterday. So it's about basically something called the Russian space distortions, and it's describing a probe that focuses on the velocities, Vx, Vy, Vz, and what do you do when you actually have redshifts in velocities? Well, the velocity is coming from the redshifts because we're observing a redshift that actually combination of the position and the velocities. That's called the redshift space distortions. I'll describe the effect, and the derivation is actually in your notes, and it will go through a bunch of this. So let's just go from what we learned yesterday to what we will learn today. We have the correlation function in 1D. So this is the one with the little dip on you know, the very interesting extra um, excess of probability of finding another galaxy 100 megaparsec over HOA. Right? So that's that little dip. But if you sweep it out in 2D, you see a quadrant like this. The BAO is in this little quadrant right there that has an extra power. Right? But this is in correlation function in real space. What you actually observe is something in rush of space. So we do, not measure in phys we do not measure in physical space. We actually measure in redshift space. Redshift measures a combination of the Hubble recession and peculiar velocities. So if you look at the equations below, it's the observed um, velocities is a combination between the Hubble flow and the peculiar velocities. So your distances observed is a combination of velocity and the actual distances. Okay? And that's actually coming to the discussions in the lecture notes here. So the third dimension of redshift survey is not radial distance, it's redshift. The radial distance is related to redshift by Hubble expansion, but also peculiar velocity, V pack, that you actually see in your notes. On small scales, the random motion of the particles, say within the clusters, will cause the particle at the same distance to appear to have different redshifts, called the fingers of God. No offense to any religion, just people name it the first time. I'll show you a picture on this one. On the larger scales, the object forced towards something that's like an overdense region. So the object between us and the overdensity will appear to be further away from us. I'll show you a, uh, a picture very soon. An object on the other side of the overdensity will appear to be closer to us because it's falling towards us. So this is what it means here. Um, when you have an overdensity, which is the one that you see in the center, at linear flow, which is at the larger scales, it will appear to be squashed. So we're observing from below. It's falling into this overdensity. Things are moving towards us will make it, you know, it look like it's closer. Things are moving away from us, it looks like it's farther. So that's actually the second column. Sorry, I need to have oh, a laser pointer, I just realized. So this is what you see in your eyes down here. We're observing down here. So this dot has moved, look like it's actually further away from us. And this dot has moved in. So it looks like it's closer to us. That's why it's the, on the larger scales, it's squashed. 
And the nonlinear structure, such as the clusters, you actually see it's moving randomly. So the outer boundary looks like it's elongated. So of course things that move out, but there's also things that move in because it's random, right? But the one that's moving out will actually stood out because the stuff moving in, just there's all these other stuff around. Okay, so the boundary, the boundary itself will look elongated. That's what they call the finger of God. So we'll go through a little bit of derivation of linear theory called Kaiser. It's um, well, basically developed by Nick Kaiser, 1987. The main assumption, the first principle I assume there is that basically the galaxy numbers are conserved. So let's start. This is actually in your notes. You might want to start making notes in that lecture um, that you get. For those who just came in and don't know why everyone else has this, you can come down to get it. Um, we denote the Russian space coordinate S and the real space coordinate as R. So now VR is the peculiar velocities in the units of the Hubble constants. So right here, this is the observed Russian space coordinate. This is the real space coordinate. Actually, this is the one that is the line of sight velocities. So this is dot product with the line of sight, R. Assuming that originally is zero, the velocity. And assuming the object's distance enough that K times R is very much larger than one. So this is called the distant observer um, assumption. So we'll, we'll relax it in the lecture notes later, but we might not be able to do it today. But that's later on in your discussion. Um, and then we have, now we have the Jacobian that is between the two different coordinate systems. It's very simple. You look at it, it's basically like this. We dropped a bunch of the higher order terms. So that's why it looks this simple. We're only getting the first order. That's why it's a linear Kaiser theory also. Okay. Have I lost everyone? It's early. No? Okay, good. Now, the, this is the derivation you should be able to do if you just, well, not go close your eyes entirely. If you can assume the following, the number density conservation requires a plane wave perturbation delta, assuming h is equals to 1 right now, which is fairly simple, um, which is just an easy assumption to make because you can end to put it back on later. And then you'll have this equation, which comes from the Poisson equation. For those who might have done the perturbation theory, the simple perturbation theory for overdensity in a homogeneous universe, you probably recognize it right away. Delta is the overdensity. Dot is the derivative over um, time. Um, this velocity, k, k is the Fourier component. Bu dr is equal to mu d b dr. This one is just coming from, from a very early equation. Do you guys see why that's the case? Yes, maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe this is too early for that derivation. But basically, if you work through and plug in, for example, mu is the cosine theta between line of sight and where the pair particle is, or the coordinate is. And then you put in IKV, which is right here, to delta dot. And delta dot is coming back down to the growth factor times, well, this is a change of growth times delta, times the overdensity. You plug it back in here, then you actually would derive this very important equation. You can actually go through all the equation on your own, but I think it's very beneficial if you can make the first calculation on your own. Um, back then to this particular equation, which relates the overdensity in redshift space to overdensity in real space with basically this particular parameter, and you're like, okay, what is this, right? F is defined by the change of delta as a function of time. Mu is the angle in between the line of sight and whatever is moving, right? That's what we were just looking at. And if you assume the galaxy fluctuation is a linear bias trace of underlying dark matter density, you basically take this, correlate with itself, which is the autocorrelation, multiplied by bias square, which is basically relating by um, galaxy over density to dark matter density, then you'll get this while beta is basically a rewrite of f is f over b. OK, I'm going to take a big pause and see how everyone is doing here. Too much, too fast. OK. Um, OK, so, so this is the first equation of linear Kaiser theory for Russian space distortion. And that's what people usually plot when they plot what Russian space distortion actually does to the real space correlation function or power spectrum. So it enhances the power, as you can see, usually without the registration distortions, you don't have these terms. 
So it's bias square times dark matter power spectrum, right? These terms enhances it. Okay? Oh, I have a few heads nodding. Okay, so this, we'll go back to electronics very quickly, actually. So we have this equation. And then what people do is that you now can expand out this dependence on the angles in Lagrange polynomials. Do you remember Lagrange polynomials? It's something you learn in undergrads and you might not remember at this point. Yes, no. Some science and cosines, yep, okay. So people expand it out and you can actually see that you can plot the differences between the two. Well, not plot, write the differences between the two, the ratios as a function of these zero and second and the fourth moment of Lagrange polynomials. Okay, may I ask who knows why we only consider the even moments of Lagrange polynomials here? Okay, this is time to start having some game. Okay, think about why you only have zero, two, and four Lagrange moments. And you can talk to your friends like if that equation does not make sense. So let's group together and talk to each other, okay? So you know how this, you know, group one, two, three, four works. I'll call on random person to explain this later, okay? Five minutes.
So since you guys are discussing, I want to pose a second question, which comes up very quickly. For a very long time, it is believed that the ratio of the quadrupole to monopole is the best way to measure beta. But we discover it's not. Do you have a guess why it's the case? So the, for a very, very long time, people just try to measure the quadrupole moment of the clustering of the field of the galaxy to the monopole. And you get the growth factor, which is beta. But if you look at the equations, you know, it kind of makes sense. You just kind of define one by another. It should get you beta. But then why that's not good? So that's a second question. Since you're discussing, might as well. All right. For the parity question, uh, for the question about the odd moments, think symmetry and parity in something physical. <laughs> So I heard some good answers for the first question. Do you guys have volunteers to tell us? No volunteers, yes? Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, the most physical argument we could come up with, I think, is the fact that a plane width, a plane width with k and a plane width with minus k, that could be the idea of going from mu to minus mu. I mean, we have like a fixed observation direction, and a, if yeah, like the mode with k and the mode with minus k would look pretty much the same 
I mean, if you're, if, if it was like a time propagation thing, then it would be like in opposite directions. But if you're just creating a plane wave, uh, one with k and one with minus k, they eventually give you the same pattern. So it should be the same if you have like mu or minus mu. So it so, should. So that's a very mathematical way to look at this equation. So that's a, one way to look at it. Is there someone who think of a physical reason why that's the case? Uh, Anyone want to help out? Well, I know someone knows the answer. No, I said, the universe shouldn't have any pro No. <laughs> Good, it starts with the universe. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I don't feel like the universe should have any preference between this k and minus k mode. I mean, they feel, I mean, in every intuitive way, they should look the same. Because uh, it's isotropic and uh, there is no preference for the direction. So. Uh, it, 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 exactly. So we have a physical and a mathematical argument here. I think you guys are going to the same idea, but it's good to have one way and the other way looking at it. Um, and also, I mean, we still have a slight symmetry breaking because, you know, we have the radial direction is special. So that's why, you know, it's not entirely isotropic, but it's the general idea is that isotropy. Cool. The second question, anyone? Thank you. Second question. The one that uh, we have the quadrupole divided by the monopoles. Why is it a bad way to measure beta? Beta, which is related to growth factor, is F divided by bias. Why is that bad? Or well, not good enough? Because there are distortions in the radial direction with K, but uh, mu the cosine of the angle, so that's perpendicular, and you wouldn't get any rigid space distortions from that? So there's a mathematical way to look at it. Um, there's a simpler reason, a simpler one. Much simpler. Think you're a first year grad student who's going in and measuring this. What could go wrong, basically? Think about signal to noise of the measurement. That's where I will start. Someone try to raise their hands, or you try to raise your hands? <laughs> I, maybe we don't know the normalization of the power spectrum, and so it's impossible to have a, we have a constant that we don't know. So this is one very good guess. We actually really don't know the bias. So that's one problem with uh, Russian space distortions. But it's not because of that we don't do, you know, a quadruple divided by monopole. But that's a really good reason for why Russian space distortions, when combined with gravitational lensing, is way more powerful. Because gravitational lensing tells you about the bias, um, which, is which is basically modulating the amplitude up and down, which is what you're pointing out. Good, very, very good point. But different reason. Okay, I'm gonna give you, this is a very simple reason. The quadruple is just really, really, really noisy. So for most of the measurements, the quadruple is a very, very noisy term. So you're basically dividing a very noisy term by another noisy term. So the, these are two very, like the monopole itself was quite noisy back in the days. So for a very long time, you're taking very, two very noisy measurements and you're trying to compute a ratio out of it. And it was just a very hard way to do it. Now people measure and then actually try to model both of them together. And don't forget the next reason why we don't want to do that is this is linear theory. So any, when you're doing this ratio, you're mixing a lot of modes and scales together and you don't want to do that. So when people, what they do nowadays, actually some of the students who know this, um, is to actually model both monopole and quadruple together with whatever theory you're doing. Usually it's not linear theory. Usually it's something higher order than linear theory. And you want to use something a little bit better than just Kaiser theory these days. Okay. So Kaiser theory is the basic of Russian space distortions. There are many other things that actually in your lecture notes, I think about page 10 or so, you start doing 
perturbation theory, that's what people usually do now. So if you're interested to see what people actually do nowadays, that's also in your lecture notes, about page 10 or so, if you quickly take a look. Cool. Okay, have I scared everyone and put everyone to sleep yet? No, yes, question. Oh, there's, there's other moments too. So I only show, you know, the first three because even the, four, um, the fourth one is also really, really, the hexadecapole is also really hard. So right now we haven't seen a very good measurement of even hexadecapole, which is the fourth. So that's why I don't show all the other even moments because they're completely noisy. Okay? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, but then there is some. Um, They're just super noisy. We're not theory, measuring. But, but yeah, for the nonlinear theory, you could get go forever, basically. Right. And the linear theory that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. It truncates yeah. Exactly. Cool. Okay, numerical simulations. All right, the next thing. So I want to show you one more thing. Back to this slide. So now, do you see this plot and you say, okay, the, I'm only showing one squashing effect. In the larger scales, that's the one that's squashing. That is why the BAO peak, you can see that it's usually like a circle around it, a shell around it, but then you actually have a squashing, it comes down a little bit, while this side is went out a little bit. So this is why the squashing effect is. And can you reconcile with your mathematics that you have seen in the equations just now? A little bit. So the physical effect is a squashing in the middle term here, I mean in the middle column. And I'm only showing you the quadrant. Does that make sense? Now going back to something physical. I see a few heads nodding. How's everyone? Okay? All right. This is hard, the questions in the morning. Well, someone asked me to have harder lecture yesterday, so blame it on them, okay? <laughs> okay, so the next part. So the correlation function. So some of you have seen this before. So I think in the inflation lecture, you have seen the correlation function. You've seen the power spectrum, but that's usually they do it for the early universe. Here, I'm showing you basically what you do for the low redshift. I mean, it's the same math but you might not have seen it in this way before. So, so it's straightforward to derive the correlation function corresponding to the Kaiser power spectrum. So you have the Lagrange polynomial. So I use L in my, in my PowerPoint, which is actually P here for the Lagrange polynomial, the usual way. And then you have the correlation functions on the right-hand side. And then you bring it down here, which is this CFR. The Rayleigh exp expression is way down here where you have the Bessel functions, okay? If you use the correct recursion occurrence relationship, you can actually write it down in this particular way. How's everyone? Any questions what those are? So the next part that I'm not gonna be able to go too much is the beyond the plane parallel approximation. So there's approximation you made at the first derivation. There's a plane, plane parallel approximation. And if you relax that, which is not necessary, um, you will want to do this following expansion. So there's a Bessel function and the spherical harmonics, basically. You wanna do those two. And you do it in 3D, of course. I have lost half the class here. So why don't you guys ask yourself the following question. Um, why do we use the spherical uh, harmonics and the Bessel function here for this particular expansion? Okay, talk to each other for like five minutes.
I mean, you can't. Okay, I heard many good answers already. I suspect multiple group knows the answer. Um, do someone want to volunteer and tell us? Okay, do you guys want to pass the mic? Where's the microphone? It, it was original. Press the red button, it's not on. Yeah, so uh, the plane wave, okay, so this is going beyond the plane wave approximation, but then again, uh, so whatever wave you have, which is coming at a distance r, for example, you, can, you, you have a sphere, and on the sphere, the eigenfunctions we know are the spherical harmonics, so that is the, that part of the decomposition, and then we know the wave has to decay when it comes to us. So decaying part is taken care of by using the spherical vessel functions. So yeah, that's, that's what I think. Any other supplemental suggestions? Well, so this is a general idea, basically, that um, the parts about the radio wave, radio parts is described by the vessel functions, and the part of the sphere is the spherical harmonic. So that's great. Everyone can understand this. And what I'm showing right here is the why we actually care about Russian space distortions. So I'm showing the quadruple and the monopole. This is an animation, so hopefully it's not so bad after all the equations you've been staring at. Um, you have a key test of dark energy versus modified gravity is the growth rate of structures. And at a fixed expansion, the GL actually predicts a very specific growth rate. So for a different growth rate, which is F here, F is the logarithmic growth rate of the structure you will see that the monopole and quadruple actually looks very different. So as F changes, you change the monopole and quadruple, mostly the quadruple more dramatically than the monopole. And if you can tell which one is the real F, so a lot of the measurements these days, they will measure something called F sigma eight. By modeling those two curves, then you can actually tell someone that maybe modified gravity is correct or incorrect, maybe GR is deviated, I mean, something is deviating from the GR. So a quick question for some of, don't, don't have to start a discussion, you might know the answer right away, um, is how can I prove that a model of modified gravity is correct, given a measurement? So you have a bunch of galaxies, and you can calculate the correlation function. You get the monopole and the quadrupole, and can I immediately say, I think f of r gravity is correct? Is there some steps I'm missing here? Questions? Maybe not right away. So discuss for like two minutes, not too long. But you should know, you should start thinking about what do we need to do before we can claim GR is incorrect? And the second thing is that what do we do if we want to claim a specific of our gravity model or a specific modified gravity model is correct? Can you speak loudly? Sorry. Right. So, so he's really good about saying that you you need to have a hypothesis and you have to test a model. So, say if your model is general relativity, we can test its deviation from general relativity. If you don't want to prove that a modified gravity model is correct, you need to say to you start your hypothesis in the modified gravity model part. And that's actually hard, because most of the modified gravity models don't have um, nonlinear evolution that we understand very easily. So you need to actually run the simulation. Even the simulations are not done most of the time, because it's actually very hard to code in some of those into a normal n-body simulations. So most of these tests are done in a way to test deviation from gravity, of general relativity gravity, because that's something we have. We have the animal simulations of GR type stuff, okay? So that's how people do it now. Let me just go to the next slide. Um, this is to give you a sense what the logarithmic growth rate F, this F parameter that you've seen many times in your equations actually, 
how does it change as a function of scale and time? Scale and redshift. So distance on this axis is the same, it matches and redshift. This is in Einstein's theory of gravity. Okay, very different from f of our gravity model. So if you can measure f as a function of scale and redshift, you have a pretty good shot of telling people whether chameleon gravity model is correct, f of our gravity model is correct, or Einstein's theory of gravity. Okay? And notice that for Einstein's theory of gravity, the logarithmic growth rates, this f parameters, is scale independent. So that's something very easy. If you see something scale dependent, for sure, then it's something already telling you that maybe it's different from GR. Question. Wait, this is, this is not GR, this is F of R. It's just the angle is, is flat. It's just the way it's shown is a little weird. Yeah, I know it's uh, even for me too. It's, it's, the, it's an illusion because of the color. Okay, so how do we do this? So now going back to how we actually do this, right? You create a clean sample, we did that yesterday. We want to test the theory model. The theory model I show you here is something called um, convoluted, Lagrange, convoluted Lagrangian perturbation theory, CLPT. It's uh, started by, well, uh, actually started by White, Martin White and Jordan Carson and company, and this is the most recent version that shows you here is the radial distance versus transverse distance, and the dashed line here, I believe, is the simulations. The solid line is theory. And you can see that they match pretty well in small scales. In large scales, it's easy because they actually need theory. So the kinds of stuff that you just did is mostly found in fairly large scales. But for the smaller scales, like 30 megaparsec and below, maybe 40 even sometimes, that you will need to have a description of the theoretical model of the larger structure. How does it look like under Russia space in correlation function? And that's what you get it's squashed. That's something you actually have seen before, so you expected that. And this is for a specific type of halo mass. So that's what that uh, 13 point is. So it's 10 to 13 to 10 to 14 or so for the halo mass right there. So people use this model because it's very similar to the theory. The theories can predict the simulations pretty well. Okay? But what we have done so far is only for general um, Einstein's theory of gravity. Nothing about modified gravity, right? So I cannot prove, as far as I can tell, that certain modified gravity models are correct. I can only test deviations from GR. And then you also want to test one thing is whether you can recover. All your pipeline is correct. You want to test F, which is what you want to measure, this growth rate of structure, the logarithmic one, as a function of the minimum scale you can use in your data analysis. And the input is the dashed line, the dashed black line. And the cyan distribution is basically the one sigma variance of 600 marks here. So if you run your 600 simulations through your pipeline and then you achieve your recovered F, you can see that there's a dis a distribution of F, what you actually can get from all your pipeline. And they're not always the truth. There's a distribution to it. So you want to know how wide that is and at what point it's really bad. So if it start deviating, if the mean starts deviating from the truth, you want to really not use it, okay? So that's how people actually go about doing it to test whether GR is correct. Okay, so next part, I have another question for you. So what people do here is that they want to do more than just constraining F sigma A to this measurement of the growth rate times sigma H. Do you know what sigma A is? Probably learned this, I think, from the previous lectures. Yes, okay, I see multiple heads nodding. Um, you want to combine with multiple surveys because you test multiple redshift ranges. You remember we talked about the growth rate as a function of redshift and scale will help you tell whether GR is correct. So you want to have multiple redshift because mostly surveys only give you one or two redshift bins. And so what can go wrong when we combine multiple surveys to get at the best constraint of gravity? Suggestions? 
If someone has the answer, raise your hands now, because I don't have to go into discussion mode. I give yourself two minutes, two minutes. So think about this. Let me just pull this up a little bit. Right now, you have a bunch of these measurements of all the different surveys, all the different surveys, and you want to combine them to get the best constraint on gravity because you know that F as a function of redshift and scale tells you whether it is gravity or maybe it's chameleon gravity, something not GR. What can go wrong when you combine them? My question is, are these surveys uh, independent of each other? I mean, uh, there's no interdependence between them? That's definitely one very good thing to ask. Are these surveys covering different parts of the sky, right, or different chunks of the sky? Some of them are, some of them are not. So that's something you need to take care of. You look at the coherence matrix among different surveys. So we can take care of that. That's a very good point. Any other suggestion? You want to pass the mic back? Maybe the completeness of the surveys are different. Yep, completeness of surveys are very different. Every one of them is different. And so you need to take care of that. But that's assuming all the surveys did the job right. So they all provide you, you know, the completeness functions there. So what do you do? But very good point. Any other suggestion? You raise your hands. I'm not sure about F sigma 8, but some measurements depend on the calibration. And for example, ground-based instrument, instruments and space-based instruments have trouble like relating amplitudes because the atmospheric effects are really, really complicated sometimes. I don't know. If That's a really good point. Um, so this is actually a question people have been starting to deal with for future generation of surveys. Like we have something called the OSST you probably heard of before. And then you have something like Euclid or W first as space-based missions. And if we want to analyze all the data together, you might actually need to say, look at the shapes of the galaxies together with all the different data sets. So that's basically what you're hinting at. There's atmosphere on the ground, there's no atmosphere in the space. Which one should I be using? How do I com complement all the data set together? Very good point. So you guys are raising very, very interesting points. Um, the one I'm looking for is much easier than this. I'll show you what they are. Well, different measurements are made assuming different cosmological models. Say, if the survey was done when WMAP9 was you know, the cosmology, it will be assuming WMAP9 cosmology, or assuming Planck 13 cosmology, or assuming Planck 15 cosmology. So when you do that, you want to make sure that you calibrate everything to the same cosmology. So that's something kind of easy, but you have to not forget that. Um, and it's not trivial because the growth is scale dependent in modified gravity models. So while most measurements are also assuming scale independent growth. So that's the second part that we need to be careful about. Most people, most experiments are actually assuming scale de independent models when they're measuring this. Okay? Even though we're testing gravity. Okay, so these are results that you can get. You can get very good constraints of multiple modified gravity models. These are some examples that you can see. This is for an FFR gravity. Um, this is the first constraint on general scale, scalar tensor theory. I actually do not do theory of modified gravity, so don't ask me exactly what these models do, because I actually don't know. Um, improve dark energy constraint, because if you know the growth of structure, you, and also you can fit the whole shape of monopole and quadruple, you also get the distances, like the angular diameter distances and the Hubble parameter that you were just asking me about earlier from the BAO, from the full shape measurements. And you actually break some degeneracies because you know the growth rates of the universe. So same thing how weak lensing actually measure the growth of structure of the universe that will also help break some degeneracies on basically W0, WA plane. So here we're showing Planck, I think Planck 13 measurements for W0, WA with Planck only. I believe there might be some priors. And then there's EC mass, which is basically just C mass, which is a one particular example, high-resolution sample of Bosch galaxy with 
Russian space distortions and bearing acoustic oscillation measurements. And then the third one, which is the blue one, actually shows all the different constraints from this one with all the different Russian space measurements from all the surveys. That's the blue one. And it really shrinks the measurements, um, really shrinks the constraining power, increase the constraining power. All right, so we have Russian space distortions. I think I gave you a tour of Russian space distortions with some of the theory in your hands. Hopefully you get to study them a little bit more. Um, we did not relax a lot of the approximation when we did the first derivation, so go back and relax all the approximation. If you go beyond linear theory, what happens? And then I show you a little bit about how you actually do the work with Russian space distortions. Um, and next thing I want to show you is something new because one group actually sent me a cool answer yesterday about what is the new probe you can create by combining CMB and larger structure. Group one here, but people might have moved. So I don't know, yesterday's group one um, has sent me an answer and they talked about the Sunel Sadovich effect. I say other people has done the homework and want to tell the class about it, other than group one. Go ahead. Um, where is the mic? Do you want to pass the mic down somewhere? It takes a lot of time to react. Lens by uh, large scale structure. So Planck has produced a lens a map of lensing potentials. So that map is unbiased tracer of integrated mass from current epoch to the last scattering surface. So this can be cross correlated with the other tracers of large scale structure like galaxy positions. So this will give us more information about the cosmology. Very good, very good. Any other suggestions? Yes, do you want to pass the mic down? Don't, don't turn the mic off. Here, right here. Uh, extending on from that, you could use the lensing maps to, I think we talked about another lecture course, to find uh, cluster counts, which is also another way you can probe. You can probe find the clusters. Yeah. Yes, so cluster the cluster counts. mass functions Russian could be a very good way to do cosmology. Yeah. Very good. You can also do SC. It's the thermal Sennel-Sodovich effect. You can also do the clusters. Any other suggestions? If you get the one I'm gonna t tell you about, then I don't have to tell you anything. <laughs> you know, pass the mic back. The lecture hall doesn't pro propel the sound. Yeah, so Planck has also produced these uh, Compton scattering Y parameter maps. So those can also be cross correlated with the last scale structure. Uh, what does it do? Do you wanna tell people a little bit about the Y map? Uh, yeah, so, so that, is, that generally traces the gas that is in the clusters. So that map is a tracer of uh, gas in the cluster, so which causes uh, the gas in the cluster causes uh, Compton scattering of uh, CMB photons. Good, good. Yeah. Okay, I feel like there's more. Okay, you want to pass the mic back. Last row. Thank you. Well, the galaxy clustering is proportional to the galaxy bias squared, while the CMB is proportional to just the galaxy bias. So you can break the genesis with, uh, with this parameter. Very good, very good. So this is basically saying that the galaxy lensing cross larger structure give you one factor of bias, while if you do galaxy clustering by itself, you have bias squared. So you can help break some degeneracies right there. And it's very useful. Um, way to look at parameters to boil down from the galaxy galaxy correlation to dark matter correlations. So very good, very good point. Okay, so I'm going to show you quickly something what we're doing that's new, um, not one of these, and I'm just going to show you quickly because we have maybe five minutes left. More? And 30 plus a little bit. Okay, perfect. Okay, so what happens when we combine the both? So I'm going to show you one thing. That's something called the EG that our group has been doing, something a little newer. Um, it's a combination between lensing, gravitational lensing, the velocity field, and the clustering of the density field. So a lot of things all together. So if you look at the equation, it's proportional to CL, which is the angular power spectrum of the kappa, kappa being the gravitational lensing, a potential uh, gravitational lensing kappa, and then galaxy, 
So those two will pull out one factor of bias, as um, we just talked about. And then you have beta, which is coming from f over b, right? So the growth rate divided by bias. And then you have CLGG, which is the angle of power spectrum of galaxies. When you combine all of that, it's kind of interesting because you probe both the metric potential. This is the metric we're looking at here. Non-relativistic particles feel the gravitational potential, so motions of these particles probe the dynamical mass. While the relativistic particles, like photons in gravitational lensing, are deflected by the spatial curvature. So it probes basically different metric potentials, and it's very interesting. Well, okay, one of them probes both metric potentials. The other one probes only one of them. So it's really interesting to combine them. And why is the case that this particular form is good? It's because it's independent galaxy bias when you combine it correctly. So as um, the one in the back just talked about, the galaxy lensing is on top, velocity probed by the bottom, and the galaxy clustering there. If you combine it properly, you have the bias, one bias term on top. The others become also exactly cancelled out. All the biases all cancelled out. EG itself ranges from point, about 0.28 to 6 with a variety of uh, gravity models. And it is scale independent in GR, but it's not so in other gravity models. So it's also a good way to look at deviation from general relativity. So let me just show you what EG looks like in various gravity models. This is in Einstein's theory of gravity as a function of scale and redshift. You've seen something similar before, but for the growth factor. FFR gravity model, chameleon model. So fairly different. So now if you see anything different um, from the original uh, expected GR uh, measurement of EG, then you can say, OK, at least there's a deviation from GR. And if you know what it is as a function of scale and redshift, you might be able to pin down what gravity model it should be. So this was implemented the first time using galaxy lensing and clustering from Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Not our work, someone else's work, actually. Um, Raina Bell, Reyes, and uh, Richard Manabon were subject 2010. It ruled out, actually, modified gravity model TEFIS back in the days when TEFIS was still OK model. So you see this data point as a function of distance, EG as a function of distance right here. TEFIS model was actually ruled out by quite a number of sigma because of them. So it's actually interesting. And then, so, but there's no other measurements since 2010 to 2015. Why, why do you think that's the case? Maybe you already know the answer. So if you do, raise your hand anytime. Otherwise, have a quick, maybe not five minutes, two minutes discussion. So we have this amazing measurement. Like it just wrote out Tefas model 2010. Why is there not repeated? Till 2015. Your friends. So it combines gravitational lensing, galaxy clustering, and velocity measurements, which is from Russian space distortions. Think what you need to do that measurement.
can, you can assume this plus some kind of a hint, but that's how I'll explain it very soon. Any suggestions yet? Nobody. Come on. Oh, hold on. Okay, someone actually has the answers. Can I have the mic down here? Wherever the mic is. It's on, it's on, it's on. Don't touch it. It's on. People have exhausted all the data it was that uh, they are present at that time. So we'll need to go for high redshift uh, galaxies, uh, high redshift lenses, which will be lensed by in-between uh, matter. So we don't have that sample of galaxies at high redshift beyond this 0.6 or say. So, so what I was looking for is that you basically need a combination of many things, right? So you need lenses and sources for the graph galaxy lensing. And that means you have a very good imaging survey that's able to do galaxy lensing somehow at high redshift. So that's what his point is. So we already measure it once at this redshift at certain margins of the sky. So we want something with huge imaging, nice spectroscopic measurements so you can do galaxy clustering. And you need to have us, well, galaxy clustering, you get redshift space distortions. Remember, we need the velocity field. And then you need the galaxy galaxy clustering. That one is a little easier. OK, so you actually need to be able to measure the retrospace space distortion effect of the lens population. And you require good imaging to do gravitational lensing and the galaxy clustering. So you need large volume and medium high density of spectroscopy over the same area as the sky as the imaging. So that's actually hard. There's not that many out there. So we start thinking, can we do this a little better? Can you guys come up with ideas that you can just change this around and make it possible? People have mentioned it earlier in class, about 15 minutes ago. That's the hint. People had just talked about it. So you still do EG, but slightly differently. That does not require good ground-based imaging and, or space-based imaging in large volume of spectroscopy. You have the microphone up there. <laughs> we have a surface CMB, uh, which is lensed, and we have that available. So I, we can I, use that. I did not tell him earlier, but he just figured it out. But he actually told us about there's a gravitational lensing done because there is a CMB lensing that's possible. So yes, so what if we replace the galaxy lensing with CMB lensing? Very simple replacement, but that changes many things. And I'll show you quickly. So it dramatically increases the range and number of traces we can use because anything in front of the CMB is lensing the CMB, right? So instead of we have the lens and the source playing like this, the source of the galaxy um, and the lensing of the galaxy, right? By the, by the stuff in which the sources are being lensed by the lens population. You actually have the source at 1100 redshift because what the CMB is, and you have everything in front of it is lensing it. So that helps. And CMB is a lot cleaner than galaxy lensing, at least for me. 
Um, no astrophysical systematics, such as things like intrinsic alignments for people who might not have, I know you don't have a gravity, gravitational lensing lecture, but that's something that is a major astrophysical systematics right now is called something called intrinsic alignments in galaxy lensing. So something we have not figured out how to deal with at all. While in CMB, it's quite Gaussian before the lensing, but the galaxies before the lensing is already aligned to some tidal field. And if they already have alignments, that could mean that you get the wrong amount of matter lensing, because the lensing actually just increase alignment of galaxies in a certain way. So that's very important. Yeah, CMB does not have that. And we have a very well-known source plane redshift because we know where CMB is, much better than trying to get the photometric redshift of all the galaxy sources, because you actually need to do that if you do um, galaxy lens, you need to get the redshift distribution of the sources at the minimum. So we don't have to do that in CMB lens because we already have the CMB redshift. Okay, so I'm not gonna show you everything here because we have to go to the next lecture and the break. Um, I will show you in the next lecture how people actually do this, and I think this is great. People have come up with many good ideas, and if you have questions on the lecture notes, please let me know, okay? Thank you.